Well, as you see, today we're going to make a brief introduction to international criminal law. And this branch of international law is distinct than the entire others. Only for this chapter we're going to take individuals as the subjects of international law. This is not what we have done until today. Only for international criminal law, the individuals are going to be taken as our subjects. Now, in order to understand this distinct version of international law, we better uh, concentrate on international human rights protection. Human rights protection is in a pyramid form. And what do you know is that, for instance, human rights protection is mentioned by the UN Charter. Therefore, what you can tell me is that human rights protection has two dimensions. One external dimension and one domestic dimension. The external dimension is about the international regulations. So, here, we can talk about the United Nations, the UN Charter as protector of human rights. What else? The Security Council is a protector of human rights. The United Nations General Assembly is another international body to protect human rights. There are numerous working groups under uh, the General Assembly. Or, we have mentioned the Security Council, the General Assembly, what else? United Nations Human Rights Committee is another sub-branch of United Nations. And there are many other sub-branches that deal with human rights protection. Like High Commissioner for Refugees is also dealing with human rights protection, for instance, but specifically on the refugees and asylum seekers, their protection and promotion of their rights. So, here we come across with the international protection. In the middle, we come across with regional protections, which is most famous in our region. Uh, European, which court? European Court of Human Rights. Great, European Court of Human Rights is, for instance, one regional protection body. And there are many other uh, regional protection bodies, like in Africa, like in uh, Latin America. I guess the only lacking region is Asia. They don't have a regional protection system, if I'm not mistaken. At the top of the pyramid, we come across with the local protection, the state. Once your rights are somehow violated, you know that you do not directly make applications to Security Council or the General Assembly. Actually, individuals do not make applications by them anyway. Therefore, once your human rights are violated, you expect a protection by your own state, actually, by your own courts. So this is how it should work. First of all, you have to, you know that you're under the protection, under the umbrella of your citizenship country, your country of origin. You can become a migrant. You can leave your country for education reasons. Uh, you can conduct your master's degree, PhD in another, another country. And you can still go back to your own country because you know that your citizenship country is protecting your rights still. Your state is your main protector of your human rights. So this is how human rights protection is expected to work. First of all, you go to your own courts, you exhaust your entire domestic remedies. So if there are appeals and so on, you go for them. And once you exhaust entire domestic remedies, then you're allowed to refer your case to European Court of Human Rights. So first of all, you have to be finished with the domestic remedies. This is how this pyramid works. At this stage, we have international criminal law 
because we can come across with many anomalies at this stage. Well, what can happen is that in the history, unfortunately, we had many examples of that. Let's start with the uh, Jewish Holocaust in Germany. All those Jews were also citizens of the German state. They were under the protection of German state. What has happened is that German state has started a new state policy which is against its own citizens. So, once the state policy turns against its own citizens, then we need international criminal law. What we know is that once state policies start to turn against you, how this happens is that it is the politicians, it is the legislative branch that are in charge of changing the laws. Therefore, they can start new laws against you. And they can make illegal things turn into legal uh, measures. That was the case in Germany. It was totally legal what uh, German soldiers were doing against Jewish citizens because the laws were allowing that. So what if the domestic laws turns against you? What if domestic courts are not protecting your, court, uh, your rights anymore? The thing is that who's changing those policies, who's changing those laws are mainly the leaders, parliament members, the legislative. They change the laws and who implement them is for most of the time the military, the army. The problem there is that well, normally, if another individual is violating your human rights, you can simply refer that individual to your local court. If it is your leaders, if it is the parliament members, then you cannot refer them to a court. Why so? Because they are immune. They're untouchables. They cannot be referred to courts. At that point, the individual, the citizen, remains so weak and vulnerable. So this is an anomaly that can happen in the system. Normally, all sovereign states have already have their sovereign states, have their criminal laws. that deals with crimes and criminals. And the state already punishes those that violate your rights. So why do we still need an international criminal law is that when that criminal law stops protecting your rights, when it stops punishing the criminals. And what you have to keep in mind is that there are many versions of human rights violations, of course. A right to expression can be silenced during state of emergency. This is completely legitimate and legal. Here, under international criminal law, the violations of human rights are already determined. And at that point, we have a source, actually. That is the Rome Statute. Rome Statute is the founding treaty of International Criminal Court. The Rome Statute was adopted in 1998. An International Criminal Court is established in 2002. As you see, the court is actually a baby court, quite a new one. And the Statute of International Criminal Court has already established four core international crimes. 
genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and the acts of aggression. So international criminal law defines and deals only with those four crimes. Your consumer rights are also human rights. And your violation of your consumer rights are already dealt with your domestic courts. And if that does not function, then perhaps regional ones. What international criminal law deals with is only grave violations of human rights, huge violations of human rights. When state responsibility is not acceptable anymore, state responsibility deals with many tortious actions or uh, many obligation violations, but what it omits is human rights violations. Under grave human rights violations, the crime is not imputable on the state anymore. The crime is imputed on the individual, on the perpetrator of that crime. So, what international criminal law establishes is two important things, actually. It is ending I guess I have them on my slides. True. Ending impunity, anyway. So, those reigns can remain unpunished. And this is being ended by international criminal law. And international criminal law is establishing individual criminal responsibility. <laughs> it ends impunity. No one remains unpunished if they are the perpetrators of four core crimes against human rights. And individual re uh, criminal responsibility is established. The crimes cannot be imputed. They cannot be attributed on the state anymore. So those are the core elements of international criminal law. And we have said that according to international criminal law, there are four main crimes. It's genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and act of aggression. The thing is that, what's a genocide? You already have a general picture of what a genocide is, and the basic explanation is that killing the members of one group. That's the first thing that pops up. The thing is that, after members of one community is killed, it can be called as a genocide. So first you have to wait until all members are killed, then you can call it as a genocide. Is it the case? It sounds as if so. For genocide, let's start with the source actually. We have, for this class, two main sources. The first one is the Genocide Convention of 48. And the second one is the Statute of ICTY, which is International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. I hope you're taking down notes, because it's not in my slides. Either you have to do your readings properly, or you better take down notes during the class. So, uh, the Genocide Convention of 48. You can simply imagine why that was prepared, after which event. The, of course. How about this one? And it has to be related with one crime then. Something has happened. As a result, this had to be adopted. The general genocide that has happened in the U uh, former Yugoslavia. So what was happening there? The ethnic Serbians have started a genocide against ethnic Albanians, so Muslims living in that region were genocided. 
the thing is that genocide is not only killing those people. So to call something genocide, first of all, all members have to be killed, and then you can call it, yes, this was a genocide. And that's too late, right? That should be the case, actually. Well, then, those papers help us to determine, first of all, what are the elements of a genocide? What a genocide is. Secondly, what is punishable? Killing members of the group is genocide for sure. Also, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group. If you start reading about genocide, that has happened in Rwanda, that has happened in Yugoslavia, that has happened in Germany. There are some other examples as well. You hate humanity. You can't imagine how this kind of harm can be given to human beings. So it starts from poisoning the water of certain villages to establishing pregnancy camps in Yugoslavia. I don't know if you have ever heard of it. Females were first, female ethnic Albanians or Muslims, were first raped by Serbian soldiers. And then they were put in a camp where they cannot kill themselves. And that pregnancy camps also functioned as rape camps. And after those females were pregnant, they were kept that they could not commit any kind of suicide. And after they have delivered the kid, Serbian soldiers were taking away the baby, thanking the mother for adding a new member to the Serbian society, and then she can die now. So uh, you force another ethnic group producing uh, new generations for your own ethnic society, and then you kill them. This is also genocide. Or I've spoken about poisoning the water of certain areas so that they die. So uh, you're inflicting the living conditions of that society, that they don't have either any reach to clean water or food, as it's mentioned here. Or uh, it's also possible to cause serious harms on their bodies that they are not healthy anymore or that they cannot reproduce anymore. This is also genocide. Transferring their children to another group. So the aim is giving a harm on their population. They are all considered as genocide. What was the main aim of uh, Adolf Hitler in Germany? To creating the Übermensch. What does the Übermensch look like? Blue eyes, blonde hair. They're blonde, they have blue or green eyes. They're tall, German. slim. That's not, not how Hitler looks like, right? It's not even German, isn't it? Isn't he Austrian? That's true. Uh, the thing is that, that was his projection of the future community. So what he was doing is, well, I'm just putting the general lines of it, of course, it has many details in that. First of all, making the ideal German couples. So blonde people come together and make families, and this is ideal German family. Plus, um, yeah, send some German troops to Denmark and Norway to steal some babies, blonde babies. And those babies were transferred to German families so that new blonde people could be added. That was not a genocide on Denmark or Norway. And uh, last decade, there were some actually researches done in Berlin to find those people and find their families in Denmark and Norway. So it was a continuing process. So such things have really taken place. That's why they had to be mentioned in the, uh, in the statute of the International Criminal Tribunal of the former Yugoslavia's list, what a genocide is. First of all, that's the definition of genocide. And here, you see what punishable is. 
genocide itself is a punishable act. This is the first thing. Secondly, the conspiracy to commit genocide is also punishable. Why do you think so? True, of course. And imagine you hear that the society is getting ready to commit genocide on your own group, whatever that is. Then what happens is you have a job here, you have a family here, you have an apartment here, a car and so on. You have to leave before you get killed, right? Before you are harmed, injured, whatever. So you have to leave your job and your family has to come with you and that's a huge burden. You have to leave your apartment behind you. You can only get a small amount of belongings with you because you're, in, uh, you're running away. But this is already giving a harm. And as you have mentioned, after genocide has occurred, that's already too late. So once the conspiracy is there, those producing the conspiracy has to be punished before it really happens. Direct and public incitement to commit genocide. So the leaders can start inspiring the people for committing a genocide. First of all, they may start spreading hate among the society. They can just mark two groups as the real owners of the nation and traitors, for instance, hated ones. And then they can for perhaps start making a referendum. And let's imagine we're living in, I guess this is Chunkai district still, right? As a result of the referendum, Chunkai district votes 90% in favor of those hated group, let's say. And then the state starts spreading weapons or making buying weapons so easy for the society. So the main uh, owners of the nation and the state, they buy weapons because they want to protect their nation, they want to protect their <coughs> state. Imagine now, a referendum happens and this percent of this district has voted for those hated group. So, if the rest of the society kills everybody living in this district, they only make a failure of 10%. They know it in beforehand. So this is how the state can start inspiring people for a genocide. And uh, they can also provide some incitement for that. The attempt to commit a genocide. An attempt, so the action may start, but they cannot fulfill it. Still, the aim was committing the genocide. Therefore, it also has to be something punishable. And lastly, complicity to commit genocide. This is cooperation, collaboration. So you are not the soldier killing the Jews, but you are the one showing where they're hiding. So you somehow help those people that are there to commit genocide. This is then your complicity act. This is purely punishable. This is also sanctioned by international criminal law. As you have seen, International Criminal Court, the ICC, is established in 2002. It's so new. But the crimes that we mentioned, like in Rwanda, like in Yugoslavia, like in Germany, that has happened in 40s and 1990s. So criminal court was not there. Therefore, there was a need for ad hoc courts. Ad hoc courts are those courts that are established for one single case. And after the case is closed, then the court does not continue functioning anymore. ICC, International Criminal Court, is a permanent one. At the moment, since 2002, there is no need for ad hoc courts. But formerly, we can talk about the Military Tribunal of Nuremberg, for instance. That was one ad hoc court. 
International Criminal Tribunal for the Former Yugoslavia, ICTY, is one ad hoc court. Uh, Tokyo Tribunals is one ad hoc court. All right? That was necessary. And before ICC, they have placed the basics of international criminal law. So what a genocide is, what punishable is, is set for the first time by them. We have other sources, and I'll move to them, like Nuremberg principles, in order to uh, try all those German soldiers in Nuremberg trials. First of all, the International Committee of Judges needed a certain judgment basis, and there was no international criminal law yet. Therefore, they had to set, set the basics. I'll come to that. Let's move to the second crime, the war crimes. War or armed conflict is also regulated by international law. War has its rules. For instance, to start war, first of all, the state is expected to declare war. If it has casus belli, it is, if it has real reasons to make a war, then what we expect in the first instance is that they declare war against X state. Secondly, we expect that the army members put their uniforms on, on so that you know who is there to fight. And you can distinguish between who is a civilian and who is a soldier. And in a war, <coughs> Soldiers fight with soldiers. Soldiers do not fight with civilians. So those are the rules of a war. Soldiers do not kill civilians or unarmed, unweaponized people. War crimes are those crimes committed mainly by soldiers. And they are, for the, uh, most of the time, committed against civilians. Do you remember the incident in, uh, in Iraq? A Bulgari prison. The torture has been by American soldiers to Iraqi people. Definitely. So it was soldiers on one hand, on the other hand civilians. And what we come across is actually unhuman behavior. That was war crimes. War crimes include all kinds of crimes that you can think of. That can be about hijacking, that can be about kidnapping, that can be about torture, that can be rape, that can be robbery. The list is also the same for crimes against humanity. The difference in between war crimes and crimes against humanity is that war crimes take place during war conditions, after war is declared. Crimes against humanity are the same crimes, but they happen during peace. And when I mention peace, students tend to think of times where all clouds are pink, Hello Kitties are greeting you while go you're going to the university, and unicorns are running around. No, the times can be so politically tense, everything can be so critical, but when war is not declared, that's time of peace. And after war is declared, then it's wartime. So that's the difference. And when I say that those are the crimes that take place during peace, it doesn't mean that everything was perfect, but suddenly something has happened. No. So those crimes are majorly uh, committed against civilians. But war crimes are committed by soldiers. Or they can be soldiers, but they do not put on their uniforms. That's also not a legitimate way to fight. That's also a war crime, for instance. We can move to act of aggression. Yes? Uh, this is done by soldiers, um, but... Uh, two civilians, we said. 
But uh, can it be done uh, by a soldier? Mm -hmm. To have military soldier, can, that can also uh, take place. And, um, do we have a source for uh, war crimes? There well? are many sources actually, but the main source that you can use, actually I did not mention because I did not want to make your exam harder. And as IR people, the most important thing that you have to keep in mind is the genocide part. But for the all other crimes that we have mentioned, you can uh, basically turn to the statute of ICTY. This is your starting point. And you can also visit the Nuremberg Principles, Statute of Tokyo Tribunals, and the Rome Statute as well. And including the genocide as well. For genocide, I have mentioned only two uh, sources, the Genocide Convention, and again, ICTY status. But under the United Nations, there are numerous other treaties related to those crimes. I mean, if necessary for your research, then you can find them out to uh, the UN. Act of aggression is the most confusing crime for the students. Act of aggression is that. Imagine, you have Let's imagine there are two countries, state A and state B. And they share a border. And state A wants to attack state B, but they don't have a casus belli. So, state B is not violating territories of state A or whatever, but state A wants to attack and use of force is completely prohibited in international law. Then, state A can make a plan to send some soldiers to the other side of the border. And those soldiers of state A shoot some missiles to their own <coughs> state. And they, then they come back. And they declare war to state me, saying that you have started shootings against my state. It's an act of aggression, for instance. So, it is starting war, causing war. Do you know what Pearl Harbor incident is? Yeah. What has happened there? Do you remember? Mm -hmm. but the Japanese uh, bombed the American shores, mm -hmm. uh, which led to American involvement in the Second True. And did Japan declare war no, in advance? That. that was a surprise attack. So they did not declare war and they have made an attack. So American party was not prepared for that. That's act of aggression. Act of aggression is a crime that's formulated as a result of Tokyo tribunals. So genocide is first formulated as a result of the Holocaust in Germany. And this one, act of aggression, is formulated as a result of what has happened in Japan. Not you have some questions. I was going to ask what happened after the Rwandan massacre. The Rwandan case is also a very crazy case, actually. Rwanda was a colony of Germany in the first instance, and later Germany has handed it over to Belgium. And in order to rule uh, Rwanda, Belgium has decided to divide the society so that one part can start dominating the other part, and that would be easy for Belgium to rule it. In Rwanda, Two basic ethnic groups. Do you remember the names? Tutsi and? You know what? Some of you have called them Houthis. And that you're confusing it with the case of Yemen. That's why. They're so similar. Houthis are in Yemen. Hutus are in Rwanda. Well, they're crowded. And they're the minority. And Belgium started to tell Hutus that their ethnic background goes back to Ethiopia. And they're almost coming from Europe. They're almost Aryans. They're the upper race. They're more valuable than the others. First, this rhetoric has started. Later, Rwanda was 
sorry, uh, two different ethnic groups were given two different uh, different identity cards. So everybody knew who belongs to which group. And Hutus were like, well, we're the upper race. We deserve battery. Why should we share our income with Tutsis? Why Tutsis are living in good homes? They should belong to us. And tensions have started on this basic structure. And Hutus later have started a genocide on Tutsis. And everything's happening in the 1990s. Globalization was already there. Communication was possible. People were hearing what was happening in Rwanda. Transport, transportation was facilitated. It was also easy to go there and to stop what's happening. And no one has stopped it. Well, actually how it came to an end is that Tutsis were running away, of course. And while they were escaping, they have also started to enter to the territories of Uganda. And Uganda already had some territorial conflicts with Rwanda. And at the end, after Tutsis have started to enter and that territorial problem uh, became more tense, Uganda was angry and has entered to stop the violence so that they can also stop invading the territories of Uganda. So it was not done on behalf of protection and promotion of human rights. It was done in order to stop territorial uh, friction in between. Horrible case, actually. How simple it has started and it has ended as a genocide. The case in Yugoslavia is horrible. For the last time I have read something on that was uh, Sevdalinka, Aydin Kulin. And then I've stopped reading anything tragic on that because my heart cannot carry that. But if you're not knowledgeable enough on that, do so. Learn what it really means, what the genocide really means, under what conditions, how, and what happens to the uh, injured ones, how they run away, <coughs> how they remain, how they try to remain. And there are a lot of stories in between two ethnic groups sometimes. So everything goes so intimate. Actually, I have to talk a lot about International Criminal Court, but I can just save it for our longer class. Here, what I want to mention is one thing. In the very beginning of my slides, you have seen that. There are certain states that have signed the Rome Statute, but later they have decided not to ratify it. So why is that important? There is one thing that you have to keep in mind. In international criminal court, To make a com uh, complaint or to be complained about, your state has to be a part member to the Rome Statute. This is the first necessity. Turkey is not a party to Rome Statute. Turkey cannot refer another country to ICC. And Turkish leaders cannot be referred to ICC. So, first of all, Rome Statute is the key. And those countries are not party members to the Rome Statute. There's a second method that you have to know. United Nations Security Council is authorized to refer cases to the ICC. They can refer cases to ICC. And veto powers are P5. P5 states are not signatory or they're not party members to the Rome Statute. 
which means something. <coughs> You're right. Especially for P5. Yeah, I mentioned that US troops are all around the Middle East. And we have given the example of Abu Ghraib prison. And there are many other cases where US troops were involved in war crimes. The thing is that they're not party to the Rome Statute. They cannot be complained. Perhaps the Security Council can refer them, can they? US is one of the veto powers. So US would never let themselves being referred to ICC. So actually, it's almost, it's not almost, actually, it's impossible to refer those five states to ICC. And as for the Sudanese case, as Boto has mentioned, actually, at the moment, there is a huge friction in between the African states and the ICC. Africa, it was like that. Omar uh, al-Bashir, he was once in South Africa. And he was invited there by South Africa for a meeting. And after he has landed there, US officials have started to get in touch with South African leaders saying that he is a criminal and you have to detain him and give him to uh, Dane Hogg. And South African leaders were like, well, we have invited him. And he's our guest and he's here for a meeting and we don't have the intention to detain him. If you're so willing to do so, then become a party and do it on your own. Well, this did not take place and Omar al-Bashir was not uh, taken under custody by the South African leaders, but since then, Africa, the entire continent, is quite discontent with the structure, saying that ICC has turned into a court of Africa. The only, it only works on Africa and other states are not members, but they're pressuring us to detain each other. So we don't want to be a party to that political friction. So there, the equality principle, as you know, is the cardinal institution, cardinal element of international legal system, international law. But here, the equality principle does not function well under the Rome Statute, under International Criminal Court. So there is a huge problem at that point. Do you have any questions until here? We have mentioned the four main crimes. State is the basic protector of human rights. And once anomalies start in between state and its protection vis-a-vis -vis its own citizens, then international criminal law kicks in. Four crimes are determined by the Rome Statute. Besides Rome Statute, we have other sources like the Statute of uh, the International Criminal Tribunal of former Yugoslavia. And some other papers are still necessary to be mentioned like Nuremberg Principles and so on. But we'll continue next week then in our two hours class. Did you sign the attendance?